Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. In 1814, Fort McHenry in Baltimore was a regular army garrison. That year, Britain, at war with France in 1793, sailed up the Chesapeake Bay with 5,000 soldiers and a plan to retaliate American attacks in Canada. British troops fought a battle at Bladensburg, Maryland, and went on from there to seize control and burn a number of government and military buildings in Washington, D.C., including the U.S. Capitol. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. When British ships headed further up the Chesapeake to assert power, Fort McHenry and the citizens of Baltimore were ready. For 25 hours, the British bombarded the fort from ships moored in the Patapsco River. The soldiers at Fort McHenry stood their ground, fired back, and ultimately forced the British to retreat. At the end of the siege, the Americans hoisted the large flag that would later become known as the Star Spangled Banner and immortalized in the lyrics of our national anthem. To celebrate Independence Day and our hard-fought freedoms, the Traveler's Lynn Riddick takes us on a visit to Fort McHenry National Monument and Shrine to learn more about its history and the story behind the poem that was inspired by the Battle of Baltimore. Nova Scotia, 8,000 miles of coastline dotted with colorful fishing villages, quaint coastal towns, and an abundance of scenic natural beauty. Home to two national parks, Cape Breton Highlands and Kejimakujik. Spend your nights under a canopy of twinkling stars. Spend your days exploring trails, beaches, historical waterways, and tons of cultural and recreational experiences. Visit NovaScotia.com today to start planning your natural getaway. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It's also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people, inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. Do you love one-click shopping? With our partner, Interior Federal Credit Union, you can earn rewards just by making online purchases. You're missing out on rewards points if you're not using their Visa credit and or debit card. By adding these cards to your online shopping cart with Amazon, Walmart, or other shopping retailers, you can earn a point for every dollar you spend. Binge watching a lot with streaming services like Netflix and Hulu? Use their card for recurring payments to earn points as well. Visit their website, interiorfcu.org, and read their blog for more details and how to apply. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to raise private support to deepen everyone's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at BRPFoundation.org. As I enter Fort McHenry National Monument and Shrine in Baltimore, I'm greeted by a choir of singing birds. And it doesn't take me long to gather a choir of singing visitors. For here, in 1814, the British bombarded the fort from their ships on the Patapsco River and inspired lawyer Francis Scott Key to pen a poem that became a song that became our national anthem a song folks seem proud to sing, even if it takes a little coaxing. All right, so you guys, I want to hear you sing a little bit of the Star Spangled Banner. 
Awesome. She can sing. No, she I can can't. Sing. You all have to help me. Yeah. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Step on up. It doesn't have to be perfect. Ready. Nope. Come on. What I think I'm going to do is I'm going to edit pieces of different people singing it. So, oh, will you I'm start and we'll finish? <laughs> oh, you want me to start? Yeah. Okay. Well, you got to come up and do I it too. I don't sing. Just real right. low. Well, I don't real sing low. either. Come on. Real low. <laughs> my lips. I'll, I'll, okay. Well, come on. I can't sing alone. You all right. Here we go. Well. All right. Oh, say can you see? By the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hail as the twilight's us gleaming, whose bus drives and bright star through the pair woods fly o'er the ramparts we watch. We're so gallant and streaming, and the rocket's red glare. The bombs bursting in air. Gay proved through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say can you see? I forget. Oh, <laughs> he stopped. He stopped, stopped, and he made made me. That's it. We'll have to edit somebody else in there. Yeah. <laughs> All misplaced melodies and forgotten lyrics aside. A steady easterly breeze off the Chesapeake Bay ensures that the star-spangled banner yet waves. There are plenty of history buffs, military veterans, tour groups, and students on field trips who come to this peninsula on the Patapsco to learn about the Battle of Baltimore and the larger military history here that spanned more than 100 years. Okay, right there, that's why. Everybody make a fort wall with your left hand. Okay, your left hand. So you've got your fort wall, right? Now, if that fort wall... Today, there's a group of Indiana students who had memorized the poem, all four stanzas, then recited it inside the fort. Now it catches the gleam of the morning's first beam, in full glory reflected, now shines on the stream. Does the star-spangled banner in triumph that way, on the land of the free and the home of the brave? School Administrator Rob Hoshall gave me an explanation. We uh, bring our 7th and 8th graders out on an adventure every year. This year they've been studying U.S. history, U.S. government. They memorized the Star Spangled Banner, all four stanzas of it. And so we're on an adventure to, we did Philadelphia. Uh, here we are at Fort McHenry on our way to Washington, D.C. And then we'll wrap back through um, Gettysburg on our way back home on Friday. So it's kind of a chronological quick snapshot of, of U.S. history, U.S. government, and talking about important things like liberty, the gift that it is, and the responsibility that it is. Fort McHenry is a stunning oasis of vibrant green grass and stately elms, Japanese cherry, and Lombardy poplar trees. It's surrounded on three sides by the river and offers a panoramic view of the industrial activity on both land and water that has always been so much a part of Baltimore. I met up with park ranger Angel Garcia and asked him to walk me around the fort and tell me about some of the historic military activity and structures here. Tell me when the uh, fort was built and for what purpose? Yeah, 1790s is when they began construction of the fort that we see here today. They did have uh, an earthwork here uh, through the American Revolution known as Fort Whetstone, and then they decided they wanted something a little bit more permanent, so they began construction on Fort McHenry. Uh, they finished it uh, right before uh, the War of 1812. Uh, and then it was used, of course, through that war and then uh, used uh, all the way up until World War II. Um, this was a prison during uh, the American Civil War, a hospital during World War I, and then they trained soldiers here during World War II. Meant to defend the Baltimore Harbor. Um, Baltimore was always one of the largest cities in the country, largest ports in the country. A uh, very strategic point from here all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean, about a 200 mile uh, stretch of water. Um, so uh, one of the innermost ports you can travel to, very significant. Right now we're actually standing uh, next to the star portion of the Bastion Fort um, that is on site. We can actually see the outer battery of the fort behind me as well. 
So the star shape was very significant in uh, defending against the ground force attack. Uh, you actually see this bastion style and this star shape throughout the world for hundreds of years, um, even before they, they built it here um, on this site. Uh, it was meant to defend against a ground attack. Uh, the idea is that you'll have uh, soldiers at each point and because the points stick out, just imagine a star, right? Um, and as you stand at those points, uh, because they're sticking out, you have full coverage of the entire wall. So if a ground force tries to scale any of the walls, uh, you have full coverage. Uh, you, you, there won't be any point uh, where you, they'll be out of sight. Um, so it was very effective against a ground force attack, uh, but now during the Battle of Baltimore, um, that would become pretty much obsolete because the British would attack from the water. So is this a five-point star? It is. It is a five-point uh, star and you see uh, five points all over the country. You see four points. Uh, San Marcos down in St. Augustine. That's a star shape. There's a star shape under uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, you see them everywhere. Um, and again, all over the world, all over Europe as well. So describe a little bit about what we're seeing right here. Right now we are standing on the outer battery of Fort McHenry. Um, this is actually, uh, or it was an earthen work, now reinforced with brick and stone. Uh, that was put in in the mid-1800s and then used primarily through the American Civil War. So standing here, uh, behind us we have a large Rodman uh, cannon and uh, in front of us we have the Patapsco River. Uh, we can see the Francis Scott Key Bridge in the distance. It's actually about four miles away. Uh, and that's where the main British fleet was anchored when they were here in 1814. Uh, to our left across the river, um, this is pretty much the, 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 one of the, the main industrial sectors of Baltimore. We see the Lehigh smoke towers. Um, there's actually the Lazarado uh, Point Lighthouse as well at the base of the Lehigh smoke towers. Look at that, towers. this is kind of buried yes, in between. Yes, you barely see it. If you didn't know it was there, you, you wouldn't know to look. Um, we also have all the way to the far left some the largest ships in the entire harbor, uh, roll-ons, um, mi military ships um, that are used to, to transport vehicles all over the world in, in a moment's notice. Show me, point out to where all the British ships were. How many were out there? Where were they uh, kind of moored and um, awaiting action? So the British arrived here at the mouth of the Patapsco River, which is at the furthest uh, end of, of the Chesapeake Bay around September 11th, 1814, uh, right where the Francis Scott Key Bridge is, uh, about four miles from us right now. Uh, they anchored uh, the main fleet of about 55 British Royal Navy ships, and that's where they waited. Uh, while their ground forces uh, were marching across the river west towards the city itself. And then uh, when they got word that the ground forces could not take the city uh, and they would prepare to, to, to bombard Fort McHenry, about 17 of those ships uh, would sail uh, towards us and, and anchor about halfway between us and that bridge, so about two miles out, and those ships would actually be the ones that fire onto Fort McHenry for that bombardment that evening. So it still seems like a long way to go, mm -hmm. uh, given 1814, you know, firearm technology, to come all the way over to this bluff where we're standing, actually into the fort and beyond. Exactly. So tell me about the firepower. Um, how, how ferocious was that? Yeah, they had the most advanced weaponry in the world at the time. The British, uh, they were the greatest military power in the world. They just defeated Napoleon. Um, there are sayings that the, the sun never sets, right, on the British Empire, and this would be true even through this period. Uh, while they were here, uh, their uh, weaponry, their guns, the cannons on those ships, they could fire um, about two miles whereas the guns here at Fort McHenry we were not quite as, as advanced yet and ours can only fire about a mile and a half. Um, so yeah, they, had, they could fire some, some uh, pretty powerful uh, shells at us uh, over two miles. Uh, one of them could be as large as 190 pounds, 13 inches around uh, that they would fire on Fort McHenry. And they didn't feel like they could get any closer? No, we uh, basically sustained fire through that night uh, they would begin firing on September 13th, 1814, uh, and through that entire day and evening, uh, the soldiers here at Fort McHenry uh, would fire uh, just enough to keep them back. Um, the ultimate goal for the British was to uh, overcome Fort McHenry, sail up 
the channel through the Baltimore Harbor and then uh, aid their, their ground forces. Uh, at the east side of Baltimore stood about 14,000 Baltimoreans um, and local supporters that were defending the city. So the ships wanted to get to that position and bomb the city, right? Uh, but Fort McHenry was in the way. So all we did here was fire enough to keep them back and the British uh, would not want to risk their ships getting hit because they weren't even supposed to be here. Uh, there was a, a fleet that was meant to sail up and down the Chesapeake, uh, keep order in the Chesapeake, uh, keep eyes on uh, movements and, and Americans in the Chesapeake. Um, but after they burned Washington, D.C., and, and pretty much the war was over at the end of the war, um, they got a little bold, um, and that's why they came here to Baltimore. They figured, we can, so we will. So any... Uh, any losses that were unnecessary, I'm sure they would have paid for that uh, and had to answer to someone. So they were very cautious uh, with their approach and, and, and uh, attack on Baltimore. And that's probably why the ground forces decided not to engage that, that defense line of 14,000 locals. Uh, very cautious. We had uh, naval guns here, so basically cannon that were taken off of ships and they had a range of about one mile and a half. Um, I mentioned that the British ships were firing two miles. So they were hitting us, we weren't hitting them. We were just firing again, just enough to keep them back. They saw us firing, they heard us firing, they saw where the rounds were hitting. We were firing 18 pound, uh, 24 pound, and 36 pound shot. Uh, so basically a solid block of cannonball that we were firing. Some of them might have been hot shot. They heated it up before they fired it so that if it hit the ship, the hull of the ship, that hot shot will do some damage. It'll go through. Uh, but we have no uh, accounts, records, nothing about us actually hitting anything. Do you know if any recovery efforts have ever happened to retrieve old cannonballs and stuff that are at the bottom of the river? I'm sure th there were recovery efforts specifically, but um, they dredge this harbor all the time because as you see, there are ships still using this harbor um, every day. And every time they dredge to get the harbor deeper and safe for those ships, they're always pulling up things. Uh, we actually have a collection of small cannon balls and, and shot that were fired from Port McHenry inside our museum uh, that were dredged here in, in the last 15, 20 years. Um, and I believe there's one inside of the museum as well that was dredged a little before that. And I'm sure folks all over the, this area have cannonballs in their collections. Now, the flag that we're looking at right now, it sits inside the fort. Was that the flag post the flagpole that uh, Francis Scott Key was looking at when he referred to the flag. One just like it. So we replace this flagpole every 20 or 30 years, uh, but it is a reproduction of the original. If you look closely, it looks like two ship's masts put together. This was a yeah, shipbuilding city. That. Yeah, so to get that height, which is about 89 feet, they put two ship's masts together. And we know that the flag in 1814 was in that exact position. So reproduction of the original flagpole, we have artist depictions of it actually to know. And we know that it was in that exact location. Uh, now, since you pointed that out, I wanna also point out that one of the verses, I mentioned how it's a witness account, the Star Spangled Banner, right? We talked about the rockets, red glare and bombs bursting in air. Now there's another verse, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight over the ramparts we watched. We're so gallantly streaming. The ramparts, the ramparts are the walls of yeah. Fort McHenry, the star shape. So right now where you and I are standing, Francis Scott Key was behind us over by the left side of that bridge, looking directly at that point over the ramparts to see what, what flag was over Fort McHenry. You and I right now are standing in eye sight in view of where Francis Scott Key was looking over the ramparts. That's really fascinating. Do you know if he had, um, you know, a spyglass at the time? I think he, we believe he, he did. Uh, the statue we have in our visitor center, he's actually holding one, right? Um, I don't think he would have absolutely needed one to see the flag. It would have helped, of course, uh, but the flag that was put up and that inspired him to write those words um, it stretched from the top of the flagpole all the way to the middle. It was a massive 30 by 42 foot flag. 
Uh, so he would have seen it with no problem, even if he was uh, four miles away at the bridge. But we know that he was actually a little bit closer than that. The stars on this flag that's flying there today. 15 stars and 15 stripes. So this is the only uh, design like it, a version uh, that has more than 13 stripes. So when they uh, commissioned the first flags to be made after the American Revolution, uh, they were adding a star and a stripe for every uh, state added uh, to the country. Uh, we got up to 15 in the 1790s uh, with Vermont and Kentucky. Uh, and then uh, for a while, now 10, 15 years, they, we added three more actually, but we never updated the flag. So by the time of, of this battle in 1814, we actually had 18 states, but we were still using the 15 star, 15 stripe flag. And so that's the flag that flew over Fort McHenry. So when people reference uh, the star spangled banner, right? That, that doesn't uh, mean every version of the American flag or the American flag in general, it's, it's actually specifically referencing this 15 star, 15 stripe version of that flag. Interesting. Well, let's walk down and um, point out some more interesting spots for us. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. Western National Parks Association is a nonprofit education partner of the National Park Service. WNPA supports parks across the West developing products, services, and programs that enhance the visitor experience, understanding, and appreciation of national parks. Learn more at WNPA.org. Whether it be strategy, business planning, change management, board development, executive search, or diversity planning, Potrero Group is here to help. They mix a depth of experience in the parks and land space with a breadth of best practices from other industries. For more information or to schedule a preliminary conversation, go to potrerogroup.com, P-O-T-R-E-R-O group.com. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It's an environmental learning center, training center, conference center, and leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the National Park System for decades to come. You can see their successes at gtnpf.org. We're walking up to the Powder House, which is a really interesting shape, but this is not the original shape, I understand. They uh, would reinforce the original uh, Powder House uh, after it takes a direct hit from a British shell in 1814. Um, it would be much smaller. They packed it full of earth around the original structure and then built the brick um, outer layer and then the roof that you see today. So if we could get in there, it's just a big void filled with earth. Uh, we can peek in there now. Uh, yeah, let's take a look. If you look inside, you can actually uh, see how small the space really is. Um, and, and kind of imagine uh, that space between this original structure and then the outer uh, brick uh, wall that you saw That's and the roof. That's interesting because this building is way bigger than this space yes, inside. So is. how thick are the walls then? Um, not sure exactly how thick, but thick enough. That at least they, they calculated and hoped that it would be thick enough to take another hit if, if it did and protect the powder that was inside. Uh, the shell that hit in 1814 did not go off. And we don't know why. We don't know if it was that it was a dud or that the rain that evening put the fuse out. Let's talk a little bit about the, the quarters, the barracks, where the soldiers, where the officers lived. If you're standing inside of the Star Fort. Which we are. We are. And you look around you, there are barracks um, that are on the outer edge of the star shape with a parade field in the middle. 
Uh, we had two enlisted barracks. So as you walk into the fort, the first two buildings on the left are enlisted barracks. Then there's a junior officer uh, building. Then the powder magazine that, that we were at. And then the officer's quarters. And then all the way to the right of the officer's quarters, there is also a guardhouse. Uh, that was two separate buildings at one point, And now they're joined. Uh, we know that the uh, flag was kept in that guardhouse. So the star-spangled banner that was put up that morning and that you can see at the Smithsonian Museum of American History, it would have been kept in that far right room. Tell me a little bit about what was happening here during the Civil War. Here during the Civil War, uh, this was a, a very tense uh, place to be. Um, although uh, we wouldn't see any action, uh, the fort was never attacked, Baltimore uh, never uh, engaged in any, any battles. Um, this was, uh, the fort itself was a place for political prisoners and then prisoners uh, in route to other prisons, um, wherever they were. So we had the Baltimore uh, mayor imprisoned here at one point um, and other Southern sympathizers, local leaders um, and officials, political leaders. Uh, there's even a descendant of Francis Scott Key who's imprisoned here because he worked for the local paper uh, that was sympathizing with the Southern cause. Uh, basically, uh, President Abraham Lincoln uh, would lift uh, uh, the, the order of habeas corpus and, and require that the military uh, come into Baltimore. Uh, martial law, they would take over uh, law and order, and they would make sure that the, the citizens of Baltimore could not revolt. They didn't want Baltimore to uh, support secession from the Union and become a part of the Confederacy. That would mean the, that DC would be surrounded by a Confederate state. So the guns here at Fort McHenry were actually pointed at Baltimore City. And there are several accounts of uh, the commanders here and soldiers addressing um, the fact that, that they were told they can fire on Baltimore City if they revolted. Um, so very tense place that could have been a huge turning point at any time during the war if uh, there was more of a revolt, uh, if they supported uh, secession, and if there was an actual battle here. Now we're looking through the window of the enlisted barracks. Tell me what we're seeing. Directly in front of us, we see two tables set up with their mess kits, uh, some weapons. Uh, they would have cleaned their weapons here, uh, eight, uh, their rations, uh, played card games, and just talked, right? Uh, to the right of that, you see bunk beds, and right now we have... And uniforms? About six uh, bunk beds, so 12 soldiers total. Uh, yeah, with their uniforms uh, hung on them, uh, everything that they needed for guard duty or to report uh, for any reason. Uh, so they would have hung out in, in this barracks until they were needed, until their shift came up, if they were called to order, to go to formation, or if uh, we were attacked. And describe these uniforms. These were enlisted uniforms? They were. So these are enlisted uniforms, and depending on the different colors um, and the, uh, the insignia that you have on them, you would know if they were infantrymen, if they were working on a gun team, um, if they were an officer, um, artillerymen, if uh, uh, they did and anything specific, you can tell by just looking at the colors and the insignia on the uniform. So we have a lot of different kinds in here because over the time uh, that, that this was a fort, uh, we had many different uh, jobs and soldiers and skill sets. I read that this is the only site in the Park Service that's a shrine and a historic monument. Is that yes. right? Tell me about that. The park was designated a national monument and historic shrine. Uh, they started the transition to a national park in the 1920s and 30s. Um, a lot of that had to do with the fact that they were get, getting ready to make the Star Spangled Banner the official national anthem of the country. Um, so, of course, we have to make the birthplace of the Star Spangled Banner a national park. Um, that designation as a monument, you see that with other fortifications. Um, so that would have been obvious. Uh, the designation as a national historic shrine uh, was put in place uh, because they wanted uh, all visitors, anyone that would know anything about this place, uh, to have perpetual reverence for it. Um, 
if you were to look up the definition of, of a shrine, uh, there's the, that first that everyone associates with uh, something religious and holy, a person, a church, um, something revered. And then uh, right below that, you'll see simply that there should be perpetual reverence, deep respect for what they did here. But tell me when you came to work here, how long have you been here? And what do you like the best about this? I've been here about three years now. And when I first arrived, I loved the beauty of it. Uh, Fort McHenry is surrounded by a uh, really nice uh, recreational space, two beautiful green lawns with trees, a mile-long uh, walking path. And to be here in Baltimore City and, and have access to a beautiful recreational space like that, uh, it, it's wonderful. A great contrast to the city. Yeah, you don't really expect to find this massive exactly. expanse. How many acres is this? about uh, 60 acres total. Uh, we have some areas though that are not open to the public. There's a marshland area that's being worked uh, with local groups in the National Aquarium um, and they're trying to build up a marsh area uh, that would have covered this entire harbor, honestly, uh, before uh, settlement. Uh, this was a whole marshed area with all kinds of wildlife and that's kind of gone away now and we're trying to bring that back and, and we are seeing results of that very quickly here at Fort McHenry. We have over 200 birds uh, that are spied right here on this one piece of land over the year by birders. Um, we have foxes, we have snakes, we see bald eagles on site. Uh, we have uh, Baltimore Orioles that fly in. It's really beautiful here. I'm sure the citizens of Baltimore, the citizens of the U.S. have got to be very proud of of what happened here and um, you know all, all the soldiers that that walked on these grounds no definitely um, I would hope that everyone that walks through that Sally port and uh, hears any portion of this story whether it's War of 1812 Civil War World War one uh, I would hope that they're able to reflect and discover um, determine, uh, acknowledge, whatever the case is, uh, how they feel about the Star Spangled Banner, what that means to them, um, and also uh, make sense of the things that we have gone through as a country, right? E even if you're uh, not a, a native of this country, I think we all can relate to this story of the underdog and being faced up against the, the greatest of odds and overcoming adversity regardless, right? As Americans, we're, we're kind of known to do that um, and be stubborn, right? Throughout the whole world. Um, and this story is a great example of that. Well, Ranger Angel, I thank you so much for your time. It was great talking to you. You really know your history and it was a, a, a pleasure for me to, to hear it from you. Thank you, the honor was mine. I really enjoyed it, thank you so much. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Next week, Lynn will be visiting with the National Wildlife Federation's Beth Pratt to discuss the challenges mountain lions face in Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area and surrounding lands in California. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.